my name is Wynne and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. Today's video um, is on the penultimate <laughs> film that I will be sharing in this series on Peter Cushing and the studio that drew blood. Um, or, to put it another way, the Amicus Portmanteau's star in Peter Cushing. <laughs> Um, as always, I will be giving a little review, um, and depending on how well my memory serves me today, a little summary of each of the segments. Um, how many segments is this time? I can't remember, but I will probably work it out as we go along. Um, I do need to do some editing of I believe one of the descriptions of a previous video in this series um, because I think a couple of weeks back I was premature by like two videos um, I described one of the films as being like one of the videos as being the penultimate one but I got it wrong um, this is probably the last one the last video um, if I am remembering dates correctly in my like family home <laughs> because I am moving up to university soon. I think I mentioned in my last video that my schedule may change a little bit um, but I will let you know what's going on there and I would still like to keep up with this for as long as I'm able because I really do enjoy it. Today we're going to be looking at Asylum uh, from 1972. Um, if you are interested, um, or intrigued, confused as to why there is no, um, certification mark, I don't, I forget which side it's on, um, that is because this is another one of my transfer copies, um, I believe it was in my video on Torture Garden that I spent, like, the first half discussing transfer coffee copies and what that means transfer coffees no transfer copies and what that means um so yes uh asylum this one probably the first time i saw it freaked me out the most <laughs> because it is dealing with supposedly the criminally insane and some of the things that these characters get up to is quite horrifying. I do want to just say though, um, particularly as somebody that um, has increasingly come to struggle with their mental health, I am not entirely comfortable with the way <laughs> in which mental health, identity disorders, etc. have been portrayed within film, particularly the horror industry. I am not um, trying to suggest that I um, agree with slash advocate any of the views within this film and others like it. Um, this is just an appreciation for um, films that I acknowledge were of their time to an extent um, because this film was released in the 70s and of course um, we have come so far in terms of correctly portraying mental health conditions. Um, sometimes the horror slash thriller industry can portray these real life issues in a very sincere way um, but you know sometimes sometimes they can't but um, that isn't what this um, video is about as I said and um, I will not be going into too much detail regarding like um in fact no i won't be going into any detail regarding like graphic and frankly primitive um mental health treatments or the history of asylums or anything like that um so you know this video is not going to be political it isn't going to be graphic kind of beyond um the plot of the film itself um but that's just to let you know um where i stand on that matter. Um, so Asylum tells us you have nothing to lose but your mind. Uh, this film 
uh, in this film, we have um, Cushing, obviously, Robert Powell, who famously played Jesus in, I believe it's Franco Zeffirelli's version of um, Jesus's life, the passion, all of that jazz, um, Jesus of Nazareth, I believe the series is called. Do love that. We like to watch that at Easter. Um, also, Jeffy Belden is in this, and I always get him confused. Patrick McGee, not Mel McGuinness, and uh, Patrick McGee was in the last film that I spoke about, which was um, Tales from the Crypt, and um, Charlotte Rampling and Britt Eklund are in this also. Again, it is an exceptionally cast uh, film. Um, so let me try and remember. Uh, this one, I'm almost certain, doesn't actually have a um, much of an original score. Some things um, are filled in by, I believe the composer's called like Michael Dress or something. But yeah, if I remember rightly, um, I mean, similar to Tales from the Crypt, actually, a great chunk of the film is um, accompanied by a great classical piece. So in Tales from the Crypt, um, we have uh, the, um, I'm going to have to put the name on the screen, I'm sorry. Um, Schubert's Catherine Fugue thing um, that'll go up on the screen and um, Asylum includes um, a pretty interesting sequence at the beginning um, with the help of um, I, yeah I don't actually know something about a wolf on a mountain I believe the piece is called. I don't want any of you to think that I have uh, an absolutely abysmal like knowledge of classical music. That isn't true at all. Um, there are just certain pieces of music that you know. I feel a lot of us have this problem that you know, but you just can't ever remember the name, um, unless they are like my absolute favourite piece of music. I don't remember <laughs> the name or the composer but I would know it if I um, heard it and probably seeing the name I will kick myself but uh, please yes please forgive me for my ignorance there um, so it's Robert Powell who um, comes to this asylum um, to interview for um, a new um, so he's a recently qualified doctor and um, it's a position as a psychiatrist and um, up the stairs he sees um, pictures depicting old asylums um, and interesting treatments but as I said I'm not going to go into detail about that and I don't even remember exactly what uh, these images show um, and he meets the superintendent um, I've forgotten his name, <laughs> the character at least, and it is Patrick McGee who played the leader, if you will, of um, the blind, uh, sorry I think I've got something on my lip, <laughs> the um, blind um, men in the last story of Tales from the Crypt. You don't know what I'm talking about you're going to have to watch that video probably although obviously if you don't want to that is also fine you may have to come here for asylum um Patrick McGee sets Robert Powell a challenge and this challenge is to work out which of the patients used to be um, a member of staff um, likely that um, this young doctor is replacing who went by the name of Dr. Star. Um, he doesn't tell him if they are a man or a woman, what they're suffering from, um, anything like that. He just has to interview the patients and see what is going on. Um, this one is interesting again because uh, like 
so my hay fever is I did take my antihistamine but it's not quite kicked in yet um like many of the kind of later amicus sport mantos there is um a an extended kind of epilogue thing after the main stories um starring Herbert Lom um so yeah that's something to look forward to um and so I, I like that this one is one that I think this particular film that I often forget about and then I go back to it and then you know um I realise how silly I am for forgetting how immersive and how well kind of toned this piece is well toned um in that well the tone and the atmosphere is absolutely perfect this one um you really feel like you're there even though it's slightly surreal um the first story is in particular rather surreal um i forget the names of the actors i'm afraid but it is um a character who goes by the name of bonnie um and she has her back turned to the camera um to us to robert powell she was having an affair with a man who was married to a woman that was into some voodoo um i have that since done some research into kind of voodoo culture and practices um and i know that things perhaps don't stand for evil and demonicness um even though we have always been led to believe that but again uh, this is a film it is fiction and i'm not advocating um or agreeing with particular representations of things i don't speak for everybody um but this uh, woman wore an interesting necklace that apparently was um bewitched with this sort of um protection spell and the plan uh for this woman bonnie and the bloke that she's having an affair with is to and I realise this is going to be spoilery because apparently I remember this one better than I thought, is to um, kill his wife, plonk her in this massive chest freezer, and then, like, run away together. Um, and he does this. He chops her into bits, wraps her in brown paper, and plonks her in the freezer. Um, and then when the husband turns his back the body parts come out they grab the axe i believe and they kill the husband bonnie lets herself in through the back door um looking for her lover and she herself is accosted by these um brown paper wrapped body parts it's like really disturbing and very reminiscent of the um <clears throat> disembodied like hand story in Dr. Terror's House of Horrors from 1965 um but also it's kind of funny in a twisted way because you have all of these parts these body parts moving on their own so you have a random foot and hands and like a head that is breathing and also like her bust just kind of wiggling into frame it's really it's really strange um but yeah so there's there's that one um i do remember that one freaking me out quite a bit when i was little um and also my dad insisted that i look away when we see her face although um it's really not as bad as the film would perhaps have us believe initially um so we have bonnie um i don't remember the order of things i believe the next one is on with charlotte rampling and brit eckland this is the one that freaked me out the most as a child because it deals with a woman that has a split personality um and i realized that for some people that might be quite problematic and you know i can say even though i don't um struggle with 
um, an identity disorder or know anybody um, that does I have done research into these things and but actually I don't think it really takes a genius to realize that any film that suggests that those that struggle with an identity disorder um, must have like an evil murderous side to them um, it, it is, is not good and not at all helpful when it comes to um, uh, trying to raise awareness for these things um, but I like this story because of the acting um, Charlotte Rampling is gorgeous um, and um, she just does plays this character so um, amazingly it does feel even though um, it isn't until the end even though it isn't until the end um, that it is revealed that Charlotte Rampling and um, Britt Eklund are in fact the same person, um, you know, two sides to the same person. Um, I think, you know, watching it, knowing that fact, to me, it seems plausible that they could be two facets of the same kind of psyche. Um, the idea is that this Lucy character um, is the one that wants to go out and do exciting things, that wants to rebel against um, the nurse that is trying to keep Charlotte Rampling's Barbara um, safe at home. It's interesting because this character, um, this part of her only seems to appear when she uh, takes these mysterious pills. Uh, I don't know if they're maybe like hallucinogenic or, or whatever, I'm not entirely sure, but so that there is a little bit of a mystery surrounding that. Um, watching this story now that I'm older and over that sort of initial shock because, you know, when I grew up there really wasn't much information or like out there with regard to these things or at least I was not given access to such things kind of at school you know we, we didn't talk about like mental health like at all um, and you know they wouldn't have done really at all in the 70s either so um, I did find this quite scary at the time um, I've always I often get nightmares um, in which I see people that I believe I know <laughs> um, kind of reveal like their true colours. Like I've never been freaked out by Jekyll and Hyde. I think The Strange Case Stops Jekyll and Hyde is a magnificent story, but just for some reason um, I have these nightmares about people just kind of changing in the flick of a switch, but realistically few people are actually like that. Um, but yes, this story is particularly a good one if we put the problematic nature of things to one side. Next, I believe um, we have um, the Peter Cushing story, um, and that one um, is about a tailor who is um, hired by Peter Cushing's mysterious Mr. Smith into making a suit for his son. Um, he has to use this strange material that uh, flashes and shines and absorbs blood. Um, and he can only work on this suit at very specific times of day and has to follow the patterns exactly. Um, it turns out that this suit um, can bring one back from the dead and Peter Cushing has sold everything to purchase this book like in his house so he's walking around with a like a candlestick there's no furniture and he's kept his son's open coffin um, in in his house a scuffle ensues Peter Cushing is accidentally shot um, and the tailor keeps the suit because he made it um, and this is, you know, he needs it 
um, no, sorry, he keeps the suit so that uh, nothing bad can happen with, I don't know, um, I'm not wearing this very well. He runs off, keeping the suit, thinking that maybe he can sell it for something because he doesn't quite realise what's going on. And he takes um, Cushing's book as well, hoping that he can sell that because he is hugely pined on rent. Um, when he goes back, he tells his wife to throw the suit away in the fire, but she thinks it's so lovely that she puts it on uh, the mannequin, which comes to life and um, makes this poor bloke mad. <laughs> so that one is also interesting. I believe that the next, in fact, the final story um, is um, the one with Herbert Lom. This one isn't really... Um, I am also just going to have to check. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's just four stories. Um, this one isn't really like a fully fleshed out story. It's kind of just like an extended epilogue um so we don't get like a flashback like we normally do as this um scientist who creates lifelike um animatronic figures yeah um and he witters on supposedly wittering on because apparently he doesn't know what he's talking about um about soul transference so he wants to possess these little people to do his bidding for him he does manage to do this, and uh, whilst Robert Powell is admonishing uh, the superintendent of the asylum for his kind of treatment practices, or indeed lack thereof, because he believes in um, a kind and therapeutic approach to things, um, the little figure that Herbert Lom has managed to put his spirit into comes up in the dumbwaiter, which is one of the most hilarious scenes I've ever seen in a film um, and stabs the superintendent with a conveniently placed scalpel. Um, Robert Powell ends up stepping on um, this animatronic only to reveal that there is like moving living like viscera inside which apparently was created using um, like <laughs> vermicelli noodles which is disgusting um the um the the staff member that we see at the beginning um of the no sorry actually throughout like in between in the segments as the um sort of porter character um the caretaker um played by jeffrey belden uh, runs down the stairs um, because apparently Herbert Lom's character cries out and dies um, and so Rob Powell and Jeffrey Belden meet on the stairs but the point is <laughs> he has yet to work out who Dr Starr is he runs into Jeffrey Belden's um, office and finds the dead body um, on the bed um, and unfortunately Jeffrey Belden then feels moved to strangle Robert Powell to death with his stethoscope, stethoscope because it turns out that um, he is Dr. Starr and um, he killed the real warden porter caretaker man um something that my dad pointed out like years after i watched this for the first time is that we never like see jeffrey balden actually um look the superintendent in the eye he never has any reason to suspect that there would be any like identity stealing afoot um and we see at the end of the film that um jeffrey balden is now running the asylum and ushering a new unsuspecting um, hopeful uh, 
into the building, <laughs> into his interesting twisted enterprise. Um, this one, as I said, is kind of one of the most disturbing, in my opinion, and I don't tend to watch this one as much just because I feel like after watching this one I really have to let it sit. I really like to reflect on the themes shown within it. Um, the twist at the end of this one is probably one of the best um, in like any of the Amicus films, in my opinion. Um, as you'll know if you've seen Dr. Terrace House of Horrors, or indeed any of um, my videos, there is, uh, like my videos in this series, um, there is like often this ongoing theme of like hell, limbo and death. This one does not play on that idea. Um, I really like Robert Powell's role in this one. Um, and I mean, all of the cast are, are, are brilliant, but um, I do love a bit of Robert Powell. Um, Cushing's role as well is interesting because he is playing a grieving father and as you'll know if you've seen my previous videos slash or indeed and or if you know much about Cushing's history this film was made and released not long after Cushing lost his wife so he is able to um, play this grieving character with a real poignancy um, and it is you know quite heartbreaking to watch that um, the tailor can't um, betray his morals um, so yeah this one is really interesting um, and I think walking away from this one there are a lot of mixed emotions but yes I really do enjoy this one so this one would be quite high on my list um, I, between now and my next video, which will be the last in this series on um, From Beyond the Grave, I'm going to be thinking about how, if I can, I would put these into some sort of rating system, and this one would probably be pretty flipping high at the top. Interestingly, this one was... Um, one of the hardest to get hold of um, in the past because, um, well, up until recently it hadn't been released in this country. I believe it probably had been released by Anka Bay or something. I know I mention that a lot, but I do have quite a few of their films and I do see a number of their films out and about when I am um, used DVD hunting. Um, Pre-owned be loved maybe a better term actually because used sounds kind of kind of negative i don't see it that way but i suppose some people might um but i bought this i believe before the new blu-ray i believe by arrow um came out so if you don't like the cut of whatever um version of this film that you might have um or indeed if you don't wish to settle just for dvd you can get that bonus version with special features um on blu-ray by arrow i believe possibly eureka eureka released my version of the skull which has the blu-ray and the dvd in it um so yes that is a possibility i'm curious if anybody um here is in Australia, the States, basically anywhere other than the UK, please do let me know. Do you have access to these um, companies like Arrow and Eureka and like the BFI um, distribution companies that release, that have recently released a number of um, sort of uh, supremely remastered uh, versions of these old films with new special features and documentaries um, because they have recently started becoming <laughs> more available in the UK. Um, it's a bit of a annoying thing for me because I prefer to have DVDs just because I can watch them on any device um, but some films aren't even available 
um, on obscure European DVD versions or through transfer. So, um, you know, I do have I do have a couple of Blu-rays, but not many in the kind of horror side of my collection. I'd be curious to hear of your experience when it comes to getting your hands on the rarer film. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this one. Um, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be able to release this video on time. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Um, as I said, I believe next week, this time next week, I think I might be, um, um, at uni, possibly the week after, I can't remember, but I will let you know what is going on. And regardless, um, the next video that I do will be on the last in this series, um, on from Beyond the Grave, 1974, which naturally also stars Peter Cushing. Stay safe, everybody, and thank you so much for watching. Bye.